Now I'm turned on. Hey, let's go Matthew chapter 4. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, we'll have the text up on the screens behind me in just a little bit. We also have some physical Bibles that we would love for you to grab and maybe even take home if you don't own a Bible of your very own. Uh, I am in a hurry today because there's a lot here. So if you want to know about how awesome the Bible is, I'll tell you later. All right, so welcome to week number seven of our effort to walk through the book of Matthew together, the gospel of Matthew. Uh, if you're a visitor here, maybe even brand new to the Bible, what is a gospel? Well, a gospel is an account of Jesus's life and work. So uh, his origin, his public ministry, meaning his, his teachings with authority and his signs and wonders affirming that authority, but then also Jesus's death on the cross and resurrection from the dead and then ascension into heaven. All right, that's a gospel account. There's four of them in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we're looking at one of them, Matthew, all right? So Matthew structures, Matthew structures his reporting of that one story uh, by intentionally focusing on Jesus's role as the long-awaited messianic king of the Jews, all right? That's his aim, meaning that Jesus wasn't just some dude who showed up one day that, you know, like a normal dude with high aspirations that started like claiming authority over everyone and everything. That's not what happened. Hey, y'all should all follow me. I mean, I'm totally going to die and you'll probably die alongside me, but it'll be fun. All right. That's not what happened. No, Jesus doesn't just come out of nowhere. Uh, there are a number of reasons why Jesus is supremely followable, we would say. One, his teaching came with an authority that was foreign to everything that his, God's people had ever experienced before. It was completely new. But also, that teaching came bundled with signs and wonders that affirmed the power of that teaching, proved that he was no mere man, and that maybe you know he ought to be listened to. But even before those two things, uh, before that, Jesus' teaching and, and works all stood on the platform of prophecy. All right? His life and work fulfills dozens and dozens of direct and indirect things that God had spent a few thousand years, a few millennia, preloading into his people. All right? And so over and over and over again in the book of Matthew, we're going to get very familiar with the constant refrain. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophets. Over and over again. But also, even more often, Matthew intentionally phrases things, packages his version of the story uh, in a way that a very biblically literate Jewish audience would grab a hold of and remember other parts of their own history that they had walked through. All right? And that's because Jesus, as the king, is going to re-experience Israel's story. Okay, but why? why? Why is that a good thing? Why is that even a necessary thing? Well, because everywhere God's people failed in disobedience. Jesus is going to victoriously achieve. That's the aim. What was expected but never lived up to among God's covenant people is now being followed through by their perfectly obedient covenant king. And so while the first several weeks of our series spent a lot of times kind of setting up the coming arrival, stories that a lot of people, even if they're not you know, steeped in church stuff, even a lot of people are familiar with, right? And so we looked at the genealogy and the birth narrative, and we, we saw Herod raging and, and Magi coming in from the east, and, and we even got a short introduction to the King's Herald, John the Baptist, right? Last week, we got our first real look at Jesus. Six weeks in, we finally started talking about Jesus. John is in the wilderness calling Israel to repent and to make themselves ready for the coming of the Lord. And as an external sign of an internal repentance, he's dunking people in some water. He's baptizing them in the Jordan River, right? And, and the metaphorical picture is it's just unmistakable in that moment. You go into the water dirty with your sin. You come up out of the water cleansed, right? The metaphor is all that it was. It was nothing but metaphor. The water didn't actually make someone spiritually clean, but it did point to something deep and real inside of them that needed to be made right. And then one day, one day Jesus showed up on the edge of the river and said, Hey, John, would you baptize me too? I'd like a turn. And if you know your Bible well, well, that, that creates a confusing moment because we're told in about a bajillion different places in the Bible that Jesus didn't have any sin that needed to be repented of. And so why would Jesus participate in a symbolic picture of repentance when he doesn't need to repent of anything? And it's because the king is personally owning the responsibility of his people. As John calls the nation to respond in repentance, the king stands up and says, okay, we're here to repent. I'm here for it. Even though Jesus bears no actual ownership of his people's sin, Jesus will assume its ownership on their behalf because that's what the greatest kings always do. We spent time last week um, spelling out that 
Jesus not only has a perfect moral righteousness, meaning that he is perfectly obedient in thought, word, and uh, action uh, to everything that was expected of God's people. That's good and necessary uh, because without Jesus' perfect moral righteousness, I mean, um, he could not stand in our place as a substitute because he would have his own sin to pay for. Without moral righteousness, Jesus cannot be our Savior. It's, um, and so even as John tries to prevent Jesus from coming, like, he, he understands that like, there, there's a problem here. You, you don't have anything to repent of. But in addition to moral righteousness, we also learn that Jesus has a perfect mediatorial righteousness, meaning he is perfectly obedient in thought, word, and action to everything that was placed upon him as the special mediator of God's people. That's also a good and necessary thing because without a mediatorial righteousness, he could not stand as a substitute for us because he would not truly have a foot in both camps. Without mediatorial righteousness, Jesus cannot be our Savior. And so John says, no, 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 no. You, if anything, I should be baptizing you. It's because he rightly understands that Jesus doesn't need to be there on a personal level. But, and so even though John protests, John, uh, Jesus tells him to allow it for now to fulfill all righteousness. Not, not because Jesus hadn't fulfilled some law that was out there that you know, Jesus wasn't aware of. No, he needed to step into his mediatorial role. That's what he was doing. And so even though he has no sin of his own, Jesus goes down into the water and he comes up again and we're told that the Holy Spirit descends down upon him and rests upon him and that the Father speaks audibly from heaven, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. And so last week, last week we saw that that this act of substitutionary obedience, Jesus is coronated and anointed as the perfect and eternal King that Israel always desperately needed. But here's the next level question. And maybe you asked this question to yourself last week. Maybe you didn't. Does one act of obedience make for a perfect substitute? Is Jesus getting dunked in some water when he doesn't have to what qualifies him to be our Savior? Well, that's precisely the question that Matthew's going to set out to answer for us in chapter 4. Matthew's got a couple more things to say as he introduces the king before he really starts showing off the king. He's still introducing the king. And so in Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 1, let's read it. It says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. All right, so call time out. Several things to point out here. Uh, So we're not sure exactly how long after the baptism, uh, at least after the baptism moment, that Matthew uh, is a little loose with his use of the word then. Um, Sometimes shortly after, uh, and by all accounts before Jesus did anything else that seems important to us, uh, we're told that Jesus was, quote, led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now, hanging out with John, he was already in the wilderness. And so it seems that he just kind of separates himself from the larger crowd here, goes off by himself. And if you were here a couple of, or weren't here a couple of weeks ago, um, the wilderness is the, an actual name uh, for a region in between Jerusalem and, or for you, Jerusalem and the Dead Sea over here. So it kind of wraps around the Dead Sea. Uh, but, but wilderness carries all of the connotations that you would kind of naturally assume that it carries. I, I've kind of jokingly referred to the wilderness as the woods here. Uh, but if you're familiar with that part of the world as, at all, you know that it's more of a mountainous kind of desert landscape. Um, But the wilderness was a clear contrast to everything that would be considered civilization. Towns, cities, little villages. And if you could avoid the wilderness, it was probably smart to avoid the wilderness because, well, the wilderness was unpredictable. The wilderness maybe had some bad guys out there. The wilderness uh, didn't have the resources that you would probably want to have on your own. But, But here we see that right after... Right after celebrating Jesus' obedience, the Spirit drives Jesus further into the wilderness. Why? Well, because theoretical obedience is not enough. He's now being put into action. Jesus obeys. And this isn't Jesus' idea. He's not thinking to himself, well, if I go on a little camp out, it'll really prove how kingly I am. That's not what's going on. No, the one who is standing in righteousness on behalf of his people is being given an opportunity to actually live out that righteousness. And so the Spirit has, that has just anointed him and celebrated him as he came up out of the water is now calling him to go to work. But it's not just a quick trip. We're told that he's led out there for a very specific reason, to be tempted by the devil, right? Now, it's been my experience 
Uh, I don't know about you, but it's been my experience the longer I've been in church life that that phrase gets beat up and twisted in all kinds of really awkward theories and agendas and situations, and it really, really shouldn't. Um, people try teaching things that either clearly are not in the text or, or could kind of maybe be argued from the text, but completely ignore other things that we know in the Bible. Right? Um, problem number one. Uh, problem number one is people assuming a culpability in God here that just doesn't actually belong to him. Um, notice that while, in this moment is, while this moment is God-ordained, it is not God-inflicted. Who's the one doing the tempting? The Spirit is leading Jesus in this moment, but it's not the Spirit acting in this moment, right? James 1.13 tells us that God neither tempts nor can he be tempted. Um, and James's reasoning around verse 13 there is, is that testing turns into temptation because our sinful hearts get involved and we turn uh, a thing that could be good into a thing that's not good. All right, um, so God's not on the hook for that. Our sin-bent hearts love sin and therefore cling to sin and, and the opportunity to sin and all those kinds of things. But who is this devil figure doing the tempting? Uh, that's definitely another place that this gets all twisted up um, in a couple of different directions. Uh, in the Greek, devil is the accuser. And it's got a definite article there, the accuser. And so we're talking about a title here, right? And um, a personal being whose job it is to accuse. So we're not dealing with some generic idea of temptation, some internal thing that Jesus needs to master within himself. It's not a hallucination. It's not an imaginary interaction. And so uh, we're talking about a personal being who is in this story for the express purpose of undermining God in the flesh uh, to, to cause him to fail in his pursuit of personal righteousness. So the accuser goes by several other little nicknames and titles all throughout the Bible. Satan, the liar, the serpent, the dragon, prince of demons, prince of the power of the air, etc., etc., etc. And there are two ways, at least I've found, that people tend to misunderstand uh, who he is in the Bible. One, the first failure is what I would call an under-realized view of him. Uh, sells him short refuses to believe that he is either real or active. Our, our culture tends to think of Satan in a very caricatured way. I don't know if you've noticed that. You know, you know, little red guy with horns and a pitchfork, right? And because our social imagination of him is sometimes very cartoonish, a lot of people write him off as nothing more than a cartoon. He's a laughable option for explaining away some socially taboo things. But that's not how the Bible describes him. Not at all. The Bible calls him a lion currently hunting you. It describes him as the king of this world masquerading as an angel of light. He lies and he twists and he manipulates. And here in Matthew 4, we're told that he holds the title of the accuser. Meaning, he is the one who will never, ever let you forget about every dark and broken thing inside of you. That's him. He's the one who reminds you of exactly how unlovely you are. And he's got lots and lots and lots of practice. He's pretty good at it. But there's a second way that people in our culture tend to, to get him wrong. And it's possible to have an over-realized view of him, give him credit for way too many things. And the character in this moment runs the other direction into a clear dualism. And he's painted as some kind of dark lord of all things who stands as a competent threat to God and his goodness. But that's not how the Bible describes him either. Not even a little bit. See, the Bible sees him as a dog on a leash. As a being that needs to ask permission before he can go do his work. That while he is allowed to reign over certain things for now, he is already defeated and will finally be put away forever whenever God sees fit to do so. And so as we read this story, we need to understand two things very important um, in this little interaction. One, the threat is real. It's incredibly real. The accuser is attempting to bring real temptation here. Jesus must be resolute or he will fail. And if he fails, Salvation is over. But two, pay very, very careful attention to how sad and pathetic his best effort actually looks compared to Jesus. But look back at verse 1. 
Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Verse 2. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. <laughs> I, I don't know if you've ever fasted from something, um, but 40 days without food is a big old deal. Uh, it's a really big deal. It can be done under normal circumstances, natural circumstances, but it's probably going to hurt you. So let me say it clearly. You should not fast for 40 days. The Jews were familiar with fasting. Uh, they were expected to fast on a uh, regular basis for certain things. And Jesus himself is going to assume that his followers are going to fast later on in Matthew. We'll talk about it here in a few weeks. But the assumption for those uh, in those moments is that a, of a fast lasting one day or maybe even a week in, in kind of more elaborate circumstances, there are only a couple of occasions in the entire Old Testament where we see pe people fasting for 40 days. Moses and Elijah. You want to put yourself on the same level with them? Moses and Elijah. And I put both of those instances in the category of supernatural, right? meaning they didn't do it for kicks and giggles. They, were, they weren't doing it to try to prove a holiness or become holy. Uh, they were called to that effort specifically by God, and God miraculously sustained them through every moment of it. So let it, let, let it be explicitly clear. I don't think that there's an expectation on God's people to recreate anything at all like this. In fact, I think the traditions that see this as some kind of requirement should probably be questioned. It's because it's not commanded, and doing so for the sake of earning anything probably misunderstands the gospel. So why does Jesus do it then? Huh? If it's not expected of God's people, why would Jesus go to this extreme effort? Well, one, he, he's specifically led that way by the Spirit. Right? But two, because he is re-experiencing the history of his people. That number 40 is no accident. God's people had their own season of wandering in the wilderness, and it didn't go so well. I don't know if you've read that story. It's kind of a long one. And so Jesus submits himself to a fast here, a new wilderness wandering, where, where he is separated from all comfort and separated from everything but God's provision. And we're told that after 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry and all I can think after reading that is, well, obviously, right? So would I. But I think that's important. In fact, I think that's really important because I, we often assume that obedience to, to spiritual disciplines on our part are supposed to be protected or maybe even isolated from real life experience. As if somehow it's more spiritual, spiritual to be kind of physically unaffected by the things that God calls you to do. You ever met somebody like that? I've been somebody like that. But Jesus did not look up after 40 days and wonder where all the time had gone. No, God in the flesh truly experienced hunger in this moment. And so whenever, whenever we're called to some kind of obedient step up to and including even things like fasting, we, we don't have to pretend. We, we don't have to pretend that, that the cost of that obedience was an insignificant thing. The cost doesn't have to be small in order to show that the reward is sweeter. Now, it would be just as wrong to try and oversell that cost. And, but I, but I'm dealing with, we're not dealing with that crowd today. We're, we're not dealing with those who want to see themselves as some kind of martyr. We'll get to that when we get to the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus is going to eviscerate that tribe of people. All right? right now, we're dealing with all the wannabe Stoics. You, you, don't, have to over, you don't have to undersell it. Jesus was not unaffected by this, but he was obedient. But while it's good to see how Jesus experiences this fast, the fast is not the purpose that he's here. We're not told that he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness in order to fast. I think it set the stage for the proper, and I would even argue heightened stage, for the temptation that he's getting ready to endure. So what do I mean by that? I mean that Jesus did not simply tick the box of some low-level temptation so he could claim a victory. He, he's going to experience and then defeat temptation in full. Look at verse 3. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. All right, so 
The devil is called by yet another title here. Now he's called the tempter. So we've got the accuser and the attempter. Sounds like a closed loop there. All right, but the, attempt, the tempter comes to Jesus and says, well, if you're really the son of God, then command these stones here. Let's start making some food. I see you're hungry. And so, so what do we see? Well, we see him go right after Jesus' current weakness, don't we? He doesn't beat around the bush. He goes right after the weak spot. We're told that Jesus was hungry. Guess what? Satan knows that. And that's exactly what he attacks first. Unless you think that that's just some special case, Satan has been running the same playbook for all of human history. When you and I are tempted, it will always be precisely where we are currently weak. Always. Always. He's going to go right after the place where our guard is currently down. And so that means... That means that the wisest and most spiritually mature thing that we can usually do for ourselves is to create protections around our known weaknesses. Actually build up the wall there. To take the places where we might be inclined to sin and literally distance ourselves from the opportunity. Now, if you've been in church for longer than two seconds, the the immediate cry to come after that is that that sounds like legalism. That sounds like a Pharisaic attempt to sanctify ourselves and impress God. And the answer is no. No, what it is, is an acknowledgement that we have a really, really smart enemy who knows exactly where our vulnerabilities lie. So let's quit playing games here. It's foolish to think that we can just manage our exposure to sin as if we weren't completely outclassed and outgunned. The lion is ready to devour. But notice... Notice that Satan comes loaded with more than just a temptation to eat. He says, if you're the son of God, right? If you're the son of God, Jesus carries all of the authority and power to do pretty much whatever he wants here. In fact, he's going to literally create bread for hungry people just a few chapters from now. Creating bread for hungry people is not a problem. So where's the actual temptation in this? Well, it comes in a couple of ways. One, it comes in Jesus jumping the gun to feed himself before the Father chooses to provide it. Jesus is walking in obedience to the leading of the Spirit in this moment, not not his own prerogative. He's not the one making the call. And despite what he is and is not able to do, obedience looks like waiting in this moment. And that leads to a second, I think, much bigger temptation. There's a lot more invested in the idea of sonship than what you and I and our Western minds tend to read into it. Uh, In Jewish thought, sonship uh, was not simply about tracing your bloodline. It wasn't non-important, but it wasn't most important. Sonship belongs to those who actually look and act like their father. When Jesus is uh, telling off the Pharisees in John 8 that they are, uh, he says to them that they are of their father, the devil, he's not talking about genealogy in that moment. He's saying that they're acting like the devil, so clearly they must be a part of his family tree. And so while there is a surface level temptation in this moment for Jesus to use power in a self-serving, feed my hungry body kind of way, that is there. I think there is a deeper and much more corrosive temptation to twist Jesus' sonship towards a rebelling away from his role as the obedient son. To give in here would be in one sense, or at least on one level, to forfeit his sonship. So the accuser comes to Jesus, well, if you're really the beloved son, I I see that they were just celebrating you when you came up out of that water. If you're really the the beloved son, why why would he leave you hungry for so long? Surely he would take better care of you than that. You know what? You've got the authority and the power. You could just command these stones and they'll respond to the authority of your very word. Just go ahead and take what's yours. It belongs to you. Go get it. So how does the perfectly obedient son respond to that? Well, he quotes Deuteronomy, which is something he does a lot, by the way. Jesus quotes Deuteronomy more than any other book of the Old Testament. Moral of the story, you should probably love Deuteronomy the same way Jesus loves Deuteronomy. You're welcome. Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 8. So so what's going on here? Or what's going on in Deuteronomy 8? Well, Moses 
Moses is speaking to Israel as they are preparing for the second time to uh, cross the Jordan River and finally enter into the Promised Land. Deuteronomy is a retelling of Israel's exodus and wilderness wanderings and a re-giving of the law to a new generation uh, now finally ready to enter into God's promise when their parents refused to. Remember that story? Maybe you learned it in Sunday school. They, they didn't want to go in. They, they made the false report about the giants of the land and, and we shouldn't go in. And God says, all right, fine, you can't go in. And so they wander in the desert for 40 years. Literally, God says, nobody that's alive right now who's told me no gets to go into my place. And so he waits for them to all die off. And in Deuteronomy 8.1, Moses tells them that God's commands are not suggestions. They're not simply sound advice for them to consider as they weigh all of their options. I think I've got it up on the screen for you. Deuteronomy 8, 1 through 3 says this. The whole commandment that I command to you today, you shall be careful to do that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart whether you would keep his commandments or not, and he, grum- and he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. So what do we learn here? Well, Israel was sustained and carried along by God in the wilderness. They were given the law, but they also failed to live up to that law. They were provided for and sustained, but they quickly and repeatedly ad nauseum like despised God's very provision. And so as Jesus re-experiences this wilderness moment, he refuses, just doggedly refuses to trust in anything but the Father's word and provision for him. He won't do it. Who cares what he can provide for himself? That's not the point. The Son of God proves his sonship by exalting the Father's command above any comfort he could pursue for himself and above any satisfaction that he could pursue for himself on his own terms. So the devil fails. Strike one. But he's not undone by that failure. Instead, he shifts gears and even amplifies his attack. Look at verse 5. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written. And he quotes Psalm 91 here. He will command his angels concerning you and on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against the stone. Verse 7, Jesus said to him, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Right, so not sure how travel works here. I, I, I don't know, right, but we're told. That they go from being in the wilderness uh, to being in the holy city, that is Jerusalem, and that they're standing on the pinnacle of the temple. How'd they get there? No idea. I, I, I couldn't tell you. But let's go ahead and assume that Jesus and Satan can do what they want to do. Right? But what's, what's going on with the whole pinnacle thing? Well, Western notions of a pinnacle probably frustrates whatever you're picturing in your head right now. Right? Uh, we kind of naturally, at least I do, uh, naturally think of a, of a pitched roof. And uh, maybe we'd call the pinnacle the very top of that pitched roof. Or maybe even a needle or a steeple on top of that pitched roof. And so you kind of look at, you think of Jesus kind of precariously standing on this little tiny point somewhere. That's what I imagine. I'm weird. All right, so, um, but a pinnacle, pinnacle doesn't have to be like the tippy top of some needle. It's just the top of a structure, or in some cases, it could just even be the outermost edge of a structure. In fact, the Greek word that Matthew uses here could mean either one of those, the the very tip top of something or just the outer edge of something. And so it's really about a, a place of prominence. And this is where our understanding of the geography of the Temple Mount comes in real handy. And so I got some pictures for you. You ready? Got some pictures. Can I see the first picture, Mr. Brent? All right. All right. So I know that the, well, it doesn't look so bad. I thought that the resolution was going to be terrible on that, but by the time you get out there, you probably can't even tell. All right. So this is a rendering of what the temple would have looked like in Jesus's day. And I had to 
search around to find one that actually included the, the mountain part of it. Uh, if you didn't know, uh, the, the temple complex is this big kind of mountain feature, uh, and the, the piece in the middle is the actual temple. But uh, sometimes when, and when people in the New Testament talk about the temple, they mean the actual literal temple in the middle. But most of the time when people talk about the temple, they're talking about the temple complex. All right? So the bigger structure with the retaining walls that they filled in and kind of filled out the top of the mountain there. All right, so we're looking at it from the east. The temple faced the east. All right, we're looking at it from the east, which means that the bottom left corner is the southeastern corner of the temple complex. All right? so, and so that would be the Kidron Valley kind of flowing down uh, from there and then out of the picture. It's a really deep valley, and there's some important things that happen in the book of Revelation. There you go. All right, but um, so uh, let, let's see the next picture. So this is a a scale model that somebody built, but I just thought it would be helpful to clean it up a little bit. Let's look at uh, picture number three. All right, so this is the temple complex as it appears today, but we've swapped sides. We're now looking at it from the west, uh, from the uh, uh, south. Yeah, we're now looking at it. No, we're looking at it from the southwestern corner now. Uh, So the the dome of the rock, uh, that gold dome in the middle, uh, that is not the temple, obviously. Uh, that, that is a, um, where the temple was. Uh, if you don't know, that's a Muslim shrine. Um, the whole complex is under Muslim control. The actual temple part was destroyed in, by the Romans in 70 AD uh, and has never been rebuilt. And so, but the giant complex is still there all right, and has had a Muslim shrine on it for a few hundred years now. Uh, and you can see the famous western wall, or the place where all the people are congregated, kind of in the middle of that western face. That's the famous western wall, or we often call it the, the wailing wall. All right? um, and the reason for that is because that's the spot where Jewish people are allowed to gather in this Muslim-controlled place uh, and lament over there not being a temple anymore. And so that's why they wail there. That's what they're doing. And so where is the supposed pinnacle? Like, what would that be on this weird giant mountain complex? Well, there's some debate. There's some debate. Uh, while it could be the tippy top of the first temple, the original temple, um, most people don't think that that's what it was. Most people either uh, think that it was the southwestern corner, the one facing us in the picture, or the southeastern corner, which would be the back right corner of the temple complex. And the debate over... Uh, over that comes down to exactly what we try to read in to what Satan is trying to tempt Jesus with here. If we take it only at face value, throw yourself down and see if the Father actually protects you, then, then the back southwestern corner is a really, really strong option because it overlooks a massive valley. It would be the high point. Um, archaeologists think that the valley is actually filled in a little bit over the last couple thousand years. And so it would have been about a 300-foot drop to the bottom uh, from that outermost corner. And so that's a long drop. You're going to die. All right? And so if, if, the, if the temptation here is, oh, well, let's see if God actually protects you or not, um, then, then go into to the high point on the outermost corner, that would be a, a really strong option. Uh, but there's another theory. And I think it's a really good theory. Um, The theory goes that Satan is really aiming for a spectacle in this moment. The southwestern corner overlooks the ancient city of David, the oldest part of Jerusalem. It's a place of prominence. If you were trying to be poetic, you might even call it the pinnacle. It's also a place where a trumpet would be blown every Friday at dusk to signal the start of the Sabbath. And lots and lots and lots and lots of eyeballs in that city were trained to always be looking up at that corner of the complex. And so the theory goes that the offer might be that Jesus can speed up the whole everybody celebrating him thing with a grand act of miraculously being saved from destruction. Instead of obediently waiting until he's raised up, he can just kind of jump to the head of the line and take it for himself. Again, if you're really the son of God, why wait? Go claim what belongs to you. And to get there... The devil quotes Psalm 91 to Jesus. He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And removed from the larger context, that sounds like a pretty clear like, promise, right? God will protect the one whom, who belongs to him, especially the Son of God, right? Like God, God, God's got this. He won't let you get hurt. But for your homework this week, I want you to actually go home and read Psalm 91. Um, answer this question. Who is the star of all the promises? Who gets the glory in Psalm 91? See, at the end of the day, Psalm 91 is all about trusting that 
that uh, trusting in God's character and God's protection rather than our own ability to protect ourselves uh, as trials swell up around us. It certainly has nothing to do uh, with us being untouchable with circumstances that we create for ourselves. All right, so that's just not in the text at all. And so what is Satan doing here? Well, he's intentionally manipulating and twisting Scripture for a malicious purpose, right? He makes it say something that God clearly never said. Which, if you're keeping score at home, is what he always does. Right? Like I said, same playbook for all of human history. Satan was twisting God's word in the garden. He twists it here with Jesus. And he twists it with you and me. The oldest and most prominent lie in all the world is, did God really say? Literally. It comes in a thousand different flavors, but it's still a lie. And it's a repeated lie. It's also ironic to me. I don't know, maybe it struck you, but it's just funny to me that the devil would quote the Bible to the one who wrote it. Like, that seems a little unwise on his part. Think, how's that going to play out for him? And so, how does the word made flesh respond to this misquoting of of his word. Well, he quotes Deuteronomy again. Same, same section as last time. Moses is still retelling Israel's story in the wilderness. He is re-giving the law, but this time, instead of chapter 8, Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy 6, 19. I think I've got it on the screen as well. It says, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test, as you tested him at Massah. You shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes, which he has commanded you. And you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may go well with you, that you may go in and take possession of the good land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers by thrusting out all your enemies from before you as the Lord has promised. All right, so if you're not familiar with the story, Massah is one of the names that Moses gave to the place in Exodus 17 uh, where Israel began to grumble about not having enough water and God told them to strike the rock, right? So Massah was one of the two names that he gave it. And they argued... They argued that, or Israel argued that, God, well, God clearly doesn't love us and, and care for us uh, uh, like we expected him to because we lack this thing that we, we want. And so it's probably because God wants us to die and we should probably just go back to Egypt to slavery. That'll be better for us. Lovely folks, those Israelites. And in Deuteronomy 8, Deuteronomy 8, a generation removed from that moment, Moses is references back to that moment and says, hey, you should probably take a lesson from that. God's people are the ones who actually listen to his word and obey his commands. And the offer being made to Israel right before they enter a, a promised land that their parents weren't allowed to enter as they, is that they could, you know, they could always go for another 40-year lap in the wilderness if they want to keep sorting this out. And so it seems that Jesus' point here is to say, Satan, you can misquote Bible verses all day long, all you want to, but you don't get to try and manipulate the one who actually holds authority over you. You're not in charge here. If you're God's people, you do what God says. Otherwise, why would you be God's people? God's promises will be fulfilled according to God's plan and God's good timing. So strike two. The devil is not succeeding here, but he's got one more attempt in him. Look at verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. All right, so call a quick timeout uh, and, and handle a textual criticism issue here, lest anybody think that I didn't want to. All right, so the Gospel of Mark briefly, and I mean briefly, mentions the temptation of Jesus, but he doesn't give us any details at all. John doesn't mention the temptation of Jesus at all. all right, Luke's account, though, does. Luke has a lot of details about the uh, temptation of Jesus, and he has a different order for temptations number two and three. Right? They both start with uh, turning stones into bread, but Luke has it as then high mountain and then temple pinnacle. So w- what do we do with that? Like, would you believe, I don't know if this might shock you, there are some folks who point to that and think that it's a gigantic problem. That's a contradiction. It's, it's not. It's not even close to a contradiction. Um, we've already seen that Matthew uses the word then in a very, very loose kind of way. Uh, he doesn't always mean it to mean a direct sequential order. Uh, and so we don't know 
We don't know from Matthew's text. We're not actually sure if Matthew is speaking in direct chronology in this moment. But Luke's even less precise. Far less precise, actually. Instead of using then, he uses the word and. Right? The devil did this, and the devil did that, and the devil took him to that place. And so to claim that Luke is directly chronological is an even bigger overstatement. Neither Matthew or Luke make the claim that they are 100% chronological. They're not trying to say that. It's not their chief aim right now. And so it's possible that neither of them are. However, I'm inclined to think that Matthew's order is the chronological one. But that's just my theory. Um, it's not because it's crystal clear in the text. I think Jesus is begone in verse 10, followed by Matthew saying in verse 11 that Satan left him, shows a sequence that Luke doesn't record. So that's my theory. Could I be wrong? Yeah, I could probably be wrong. All right, um, but back to the text. So suddenly, suddenly Jesus and Satan are on a very high mountain together. All right? Still not sure how travel works in this, morning, in this moment, but okay. We're, we're, we're also to not, not told what mountain, which obviously leads to people speculating and kind of insert, asserting their own theories about this. I've personally seen people argue that clearly it was the Mount of Olives because it would have been right next door. Okay. Uh, I've seen other people argue that, well, maybe it was Mount Nebo because he keeps referencing Deuteronomy and Mount Nebo is where God took Moses to overlook the promised land without him allowing him to go in himself. And so that would be a nice like poetic thing, right? And then some people argue, well, I bet it was Sinai because God's people had a really long history with Sinai and you know, dealt with the wilderness wanderings and all those kinds of things, right? I've, I've seen people say, no, 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 it, surely it was Everest because if God, if he's going to be taken to a mountain to oversee all the countries of the world, you have to go to the tallest mountain, right? Obviously that's true. And I've seen people argue that it wasn't a mountain at all, but just some point way up in the sky because how else would you be able to see all the countries of the earth? And it was, just, it was just, the globe was laid out in front of them. So which is it? I don't know. And I think in God's good wisdom, he, he chose not to tell us. Because we do something weird with it, right? And ultimately, it, it doesn't matter. What matters is that the devil offers Jesus another shortcut to glory. Satan knows exactly what will happen if the incarnate son succeeds in his vocation. He knows exactly what's going to happen. He, he will be exalted by the Father, and he will be given a name that is above every other name, but we need to pay very, very careful attention to the brand and pathway of that glory, all right? There is a spiritual reality that's buried and assumed here that's, that's not present in Matthew's text, but it is present in, in Luke. Uh, in Luke 4, 6, the devil says this, To you I will give all the, this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. Does that mean that the, that the devil rules over everything on earth right now? That he actually has the power to give some of that rulership to Jesus? Well, in one sense, the answer is yes. Ephesians 2.2, 2, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, John 12.31. There, Jesus actually himself calls Satan the ruler of this world. Satan reigns over, a temporary, reigns over the world in a temporary sense because his influence is a kingdom of darkness. He has blinding eyes, right? But in another sense, the answer is no. Satan doesn't have authority to give away to whom he will. He's a liar. He's done that before. And Jesus knows it. So where's the temptation here? Well, the temptation comes in skipping all of the stuff that Jesus is supposed to do to earn his rightful place as king of kings and name above all names. His substitutionary death for the sin of the world. See, the reason the obedient son came was to suffer. And the offer on the table here is, well, if you'll just skip the whole cross and resurrection stuff, I'll go ahead and share with you what I have. You'll get that kingly glory. You'll reign over peoples and nations. Sure, you can have it. He was tempted to try and seize the Father's reward without obediently enduring the Father's will. But as smart and cunning as the devil often is, I think he slips up and reveals too much here. What's the cost of Jesus shortcutting that glory? What, what's the price for it? That as creator, he should fall down and worship what he has created. And so how does the one who was there at the creation of Satan respond to this offer? <laughs> Just be gone. Get out of here. 
For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. The, and yet, yet again, Jesus quotes Deuteronomy. Again, chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse 13 says this. It is the Lord your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you. For the Lord your God is in your midst, is a jealous God. Lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you, and he destroy you from off the face of the earth. All right, so Moses warns the Israelites that regardless of whatever opportunities they think they may be having in this new land around them, they're going to be surrounded by a bunch of new peoples and, and, and a bunch of new opportunities to worship false gods. He makes the promise to them that worshiping those false gods will certainly, surely end in disaster. The true God will not sit back and allow his covenant people to do that. He will act jealously for that which is good. And so it's my theory, this is just me, but I think that this little exchange between Satan and Jesus might have gone on for a little bit longer, but Satan overplayed his hand. You know, Jesus, why don't you just go ahead and skip all that really hard stuff and just bow down and worship me? I'll, I'll make it worth your while. But Jesus knows better, right? Because the eternal son feels about idolatry the exact same way that the eternal father feels about idolatry. It riles him to a holy and jealous, righteous anger. And so Jesus just tells him to go away. Be gone. Get out of here. Get, get out of here with your sad little excuse for authority. He calls him Satan, which is the third title that uh, this individual is given in the text. Satan means adversary, opponent. He's set against what is good and right. And so in Luke's account, we're told that, that, that the devil sh- kind of shrunk away until a more opportune time. So he kind of skulks away, right? But Jesus did it. Woo! He endured the fast. Yay! He trusted in the Father's provision instead of anything he could pursue for himself. And his obedience and love for the Father and even the Father's will are exalted and they're vindicated as he fights off the temptation at its fullest. He did it. The king who identifies with his people re-experiences what his people did. But this time, not without failure. He did it with victory. Even though Jesus... Even though Jesus' life work of obedience is not over, this act of obedience is. So we're, we're told that the Father lavishes him with rest and reward. It's finished. So, so what do we do with this stuff? Hmm? How do we respond to, to God's word this morning? Well, if you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, I, I think our response is twofold. We, we start by celebrating the victorious obedience of the Son. Like that it is... Because he achieved for us what we clearly could never achieve for ourselves. Like, that, that deserves celebration and exaltation. I don't know about you, but I desperately need Jesus' perfect mediatorial righteousness. I depend on it. It is by his obedience uh, in my place that I can be reconciled to God. And that deserves rejoicing. It does. But secondly, I think we also need to respond by doing everything in our power to follow the victorious pattern that he has set for righteousness in the midst of temptation. Church, he has not left his people without a template. Jesus did not fight off temptation by sheer willpower or by extreme self-discipline or or by heightened intellect. He fought off temptation by intimately knowing God's promises in his word. So can you. And he fought off temptation by trusting the Father and the Father's provision and the Father's plan over and above everything he could chase after on his own terms. So can you and I. While we do not bring sinlessness to the table, we have been given good tools to genuinely pursue righteousness before the Lord. That part was, is within our reach. And I'm thankful for the cross because our Savior knows our frame. I'm dependent upon the cross because I I cannot succeed in this. But let us not come to the cross embracing our sin instead of fighting with everything in us against our sin. Those are two separate postures. So I'm going to pray and we're going to sing another song. That's a time we set aside each week to give space for for you to respond. Use it. If you want to talk after we're done, I'm here for it. But what if you're here this morning and you're not a follower of Jesus? How can you respond? By meeting Jesus. It's that simple. The Bible teaches that because of our sin, we are all separated relationally from God and that we are all owed the just and right punishment for that sin. The Bible sometimes calls that punishment God's wrath. But the Bible also teaches 
The Bible also teaches that God is rich in mercy and that he loves us with a great love, that even when we are spiritually dead in our, in our trespasses and sins, he makes us alive through the grace of Christ. God the Father sent God the obedient Son, and he put on flesh, and he dwelt among us, and he lived sinlessly in our place and died sacrificially in our place and rose victoriously uh, so that we might also be raised. And now, as the king who conquered sin and death, he calls on you to, uh, to turn away from your sin and to turn to him as as Savior and Lord, and you can do that today. Man, I'd love to be helpful to you. Let's talk. You can respond to Jesus this morning. Maybe you're here today and you need to respond in some other kind of way. Maybe that's by formally joining our church family, or maybe it's by time to finally be obedient to Jesus' command to be baptized, or maybe, maybe today's a good day to say yes to some call he's placing on your heart to take the gospel somewhere far away from here. I don't know, who that, I don't know what that is for you. I don't know what your response looks like, but I do know that God's word is good. And we can all respond to it together. So let's do that together. Father, thank you so much for the scriptures and for the book of Matthew. Thank you for sending the perfect, obedient son. Thank you that thank you that you gave us your word not, not to bear upon us but to actually stand upon brings life and rest and also wisdom as the tempter and accuser and adversary works against us. Father, thank you for the cross. For those, uh, as we are unable to actually pull off perfect righteousness, But let us not lazily walk our way there. Let's fight with everything in us for that which is good and holy and lovely and pleasing to you. Father, for those in here who don't know you yet, would you make yourself known? Call people into your kingdom today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.